Welcome to the Free Speech Nation podcast with me, Andrew Doyle. Today, I'm delighted to welcome my guest, Mara Yamauchi. Mara is a two-time Olympian, Commonwealth Games bronze medalist, and one of the fastest female marathon runners ever. She just written this book, Marathon Wisdom and Elite Athletes Insights on Running and Life. That's published by Maya and Maya Sport. I hope you enjoy the podcast as much as I did. Mara, thank you very much for joining me today. Pleasure. Thank and you for having me. And congratulations on the book as well, uh, which is out now. Now, it's been 10 years since your uh, last Olympic appearance. So why did you decide to write this book at this time? So I've had it as an idea for about 10 years, actually. I wanted to get something down about my running career. Mm. Uh, but pressure of other work meant I never could find the time to to um, you know, really concentrate on it. And then COVID came along and a lot of my work was cancelled. And that was a great opportunity for me to really knuckle down and write it. And two reasons, really. One is I want to help other people to, to run faster, enjoy their running, <laughs> but also to make the best of any non-running project they have um, going on in their lives. It, it, the market basically is runners, but also other people taking on big projects. And also I wanted to uh, record uh, for myself for the future something about my career before it's too late and I've forgotten about <laughs> it. <laughs> so I suppose part mem memoir, part uh, advice to aspiring athletes, is that right? Yes. Maybe talk to us a bit about the, the structure of the book and what yeah. you've done there. So it's 42.195 insights on running and life <laughs> and uh, 42.195 is the number of kilometres in a marathon. Um, so they're little nuggets of wisdom uh, which I learned through being an elite athlete. Um, so it's, it's advice but also I really want my readers to think critically and almost sort of be their own coaches mm -hmm. um, to, because so, so much of what's out there at the moment about in, information about running is kind of spoon feeding you of what to do, training plans and stuff. And I think what, what you really need to do is think for yourself, how do I, how do I train better to run faster? Um, so it's, yeah, it's encouraging my readers to think for themselves and it's, yes. the, it's the nuggets of wisdom well, that I learned. It feels like it's that combination of, of obviously physical prowess, but also psychological preparedness. You know, I mean, it must be uh, it, it, it must be an incredible feeling to have reached the top, to be one of the very best in the world. I mean, what kind of discipline does it require? And is it do you have to be born with that kind of innate <laughs> aptitude or, or is it something you can work towards? I think there is an element of having the right character for it. Mm. The marathon is a very long event obviously so a lot of the training has to be very long, it can be quite lonely. You have to have that patience and determination to do all the training. Um, but the nuts and bolts of it can be learned for sure. There's really nothing complicated about it. Did you always know that you wanted to be an athlete professionally? At age 11 I had a dream to become an elite athlete having watched the 1984 Olympics. And I was good at sport, I was very active as a child, and I had stamina for endurance events. I'm no, I'm no good at sprinting. Um, so yes, I had this kind of wish from a young age, but I never knew how I would actually do it until I was much older. So for you, uh, role models were important. The fact that you'd seen other people mm. do this, that mattered to you. Was there anyone in particular who you admired? So in 1984, Daley Thompson, the decathlete, was my hero and him, him excelling in all those different events really struck me at the Olympics. And then later on, other athletes, as I got into running, as I got older, other athletes um, became role models. Of course, people like Paula Radcliffe, but also I spent a lot of time in Japan. So a lot of the, the great female marathon runners there became, became role models. Mm. Noguchi Mizuki, who won the Athens Olympics. Uh, Takahashi Naoko, who won the Sydney Olympics. Um, so there were a variety. And when you're doing th this kind of training, which you describe as very lonely, um, mm. d doesn't it feel like some days you feel like, I just can't be bothered, I've just got to give up? <laughs> you know, it's, it just, that would be my approach, to be honest. I don't think I'd have the, yeah. the, the discipline to do this every day, even when, I, yeah. even when it hurt, you know? Yeah, there, there are, of course, days like that. Um, but I think you have if you have this sort of drive to be the top in a sport that is what gives you the engine to to get yourself out there even when you don't feel like it or the weather's bad you have this kind of burning desire to to be really good at your sport which is great because it's hard work and you need that kind of desire but w at the end of my elite career that desire just kind of went and that was very difficult because I no longer had that sort of drive to, to get out there and push myself and, 
and, and that transition, I think a lot of elite athletes find very difficult. Why does that happen? Why does that drive disappear? Yeah, I think it's, well, it's age. It's, you know, I, I reached the age where I just couldn't physically do the training required to be at the top anymore. Mm. Uh, if you've achieved everything you want to achieve, I mean, I, I didn't really achieve everything I wanted to achieve, but I got quite close. Yes. Um, as you get older, other things become more important in life. Um, you might get a bit cynical about some of the <laughs> slightly uglier sides of, of sport. Um, and I think there's only a limited amount of time that you can lead that kind of life. It's very tough, it's very disciplined, you miss out on other things. And I mean, That's what's so interesting mm. is that, that really when athletes get, get past their peak, they're mm. still very young. Yeah. You know, they're still, <laughs> yeah. they're, st they're, they're still, you know, yeah. relatively early in their life with so much more that they might want yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah. You hear people say athletes retire twice. And as you say, I think this is partly why elite athletes suffer a lot of mental ill health when they retire, because you're retired, your life as you've known it, your whole mm. identity is, is over, but you're still a young person. And then the rest of your life is, is there looming before you. And if you don't have other skills to, to fall back on, you can think, well, wow, what am I going to do now? I mean, that's fascinating because virtually every other job you can keep working up until retirement yeah. age. And, you know, if you're in the creative arts, if you're an actor, you know, there's always yeah. going to be roles for older yeah. people. It just doesn't apply in sports. So is it the case that, you know, your, your choice is to go into something completely different or you have to then go into commentary or coaching mm. or, or those kinds of avenues that mm. are available? Yeah, well, of course, there are secondary sports careers like commentary coaching, which I'm doing now. And a, lo a lot of athletes go into sports administration, uh, journalism, but some completely retra retrain. I mean, Goldie Sayers, who won the bronze medal in the javelin in Beijing, she's a property developer, runs her own business. Right. So these are the decisions that athletes face. You know, they, they have to decide, OK, can I make a career, second career out of sport or do I do something totally different, in which case what? Yes. I mean, I was quite lucky because I was a diplomat before I became an athlete. Yes. So I had skills like Japanese to fall back on. But, but for many athletes, you know, they go straight into full time sport as very young adults, straight out of education, they haven't got work experience. So it can be quite a difficult transition. And I want to come back to your time in Japan in a, in a short while, but just sticking to that theme, you know, if you're a young athlete, it's almost as though you have to make the decision that that is to be your vocation from a very mm. early age. And mm. invariably, that would mean that you suffer, that other avenues get closed off. Yes. And, you know, so that's quite a big, heavy decision for someone so mm. young to make, isn't it? It is a big decision. I mean, in some sports, you have to be good from a very young age, mm. swimming, gymnastics, tennis, the marathon is at the opposite end of the age spectrum. You can be good at it much older. Right. But yeah, you as an athlete, let's say you're 18 years old, you leave school. At that point, you kind of have to make a choice. Am I going to become a full-time athlete or am I going to get a job? And for me, I wasn't good enough at that age to be an athlete. So I went for the full-time job option. Mm -hmm. But I, I later returned to sport, which, which you can do in the marathon, but you can't do in a lot of events. Um, so I was quite on, lucky. Does it depend on family attitude as well? I mean, I, I spoke mm. to Matt Letizia on this podcast and he had a very supportive family, knowing that he wanted to be a professional footballer from a very young age. Mm. But I imagine a lot, of, a lot of parents would say, no, you've got to get your degree. Mm. But of course, if you go away and do that, then you have yeah. you've scuppered your chance of. Your yeah, other it's vocation. very much dependent on circumstances, including your family members. And mm. I mean, my parents. Well, they, they encouraged me to get a proper job after I left <laughs> education, so I became a civil servant. Um, but they also supported me in sport. Um, but, you know, there are other choices, like, you know, I, I went to Japan with the Foreign Office, and that opened the marathon world in Japan to me. Mm. And Japan is a marathon superpower. So, so that was a kind of um, coincidence in a way. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of it is, is very much down to chance. And when I left university, uh, a coach I knew a little bit, Julian Gota, um, he said to me, move to North London and train with Bob Parker. And Bob Parker, he sadly passed away now. He coached Dave Bedford to the world record in the 70s. So I, I did that. And that was really the foundation of my later career. So had I just by chance not had that conversation with Julian, things might yeah. have turned out very different.
Do you think there is sufficient provision for young people who want to go into the athletic world? I mean, is there enough funding from the government? Is it taken seriously enough? I mean, and also, if you're from a poorer background, is it really an option for you? I think it varies by sport. So in athletics, once you reach quite a high level, then you will be you, you may be supported by the elite sport world class performance program funded mm -hmm. by the lottery. But until that point, you're on your own, really. If you're in a really good club, you're able to earn a little bit of money from it. That's great. But for a lot of athletes, you know, that, that's not the case. But then in sports like football, you know, all the big clubs have, have junior development programs. So, yes. t you know, talent spotting is much more organized, much more well-funded. So I think it varies by sport. But athletics is quite an individual sport. Um, so you kind of have to create your own path. And you say that you were, some of the training was quite a lonely process, but did you have support from other athletes and coaches? And, and is there a kind of community that, that helps oh. you through it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I had support from so many people. It's very much a team effort at elite level. So when I was training with Bob Parker's group, you know, there was him, his wife. Sadly, she passed away as well while I was there. Uh, all those athletes. Um, and then later you know other coaches other athletes um i trained in kingston with another coach called alan story for a period of time um medics physios you know a huge number of people when you see an elite athlete performing at something like the olympics it, it looks like just them yes. but that really is not the case at all yeah and you say that i mean obviously you were working as a diplomat in japan before this so your your trajectory is quite different from from mm. other athletes so yeah. talk me through that so what what happened when you got to japan and what were you doing there <laughs> so after i left full-time education i got a proper job and i i went into the foreign office mm. and then i was posted to tokyo to the british embassy in tokyo and part of that was learning japanese so i, w I was in the embassy for three years uh, I was doing covering UK Japan bilateral relations, Japanese uh, politics, uh, some Japan Africa angles, and then I was also supervising the language school that the embassy had there. Um, so I, I went to Japan initially with through work, um, and then I came back from my posting in uh, when I was 29 in 2002, and I thought at that point. Like this dream to be an, a, a world-class athlete, it's kind of now or never. <laughs> and you mentioned that Japan was a superpower when mm. it comes to the marathon. So had you been, I suppose, dabbling in that while you were out there as a diplomat? Had you been keeping up your... Yeah, I'd, I'd been trying to train at a reasonable level. I mean, it was, certainly wasn't anything like elite level, but I just tried to keep some level of fitness going. Mm. And I did other sports as well. Um, and while I was there, Naoko Takahashi won the Sydney Olympics... Uh, and she was the first woman ever to go under 2.20, 2 hours 20 for the marathon. Yes. So this was massive news in Japan and, you know, the, the, the marathon was, was very much on my radar. So when I came back, I switched my work to part-time so that I could train part-time and work part-time and develop to the point where I could earn a living as an athlete. Did you enjoy the work as a diplomat? Yes. Um, I mean, it was very varied and really interesting. Um, I mean, there, there were some difficult times, but <laughs> yeah. but overall, it was it was fascinating. Yeah. The Did you not feel that, that was going to be your whole lifelong career at the time? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't consider myself very good at persuading other people to do what I want them to do. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the most important skill in diplomacy. Yes. Um, so I I I kind of felt perhaps I didn't have the natural personality for it and in your um, mind you were always thinking of uh going becoming an athlete even yeah i mean i had this dream from age 11 to be a world-class athlete but i i couldn't do it straight out of university because i wasn't good enough i couldn't earn any money yes so i, I went into work and all that time while i was working i had this dream at the back of my mind that at some point if i could i would go back to trying to do do sport to an elite level so when you made that decision and you moved back and and you're starting to train Mm -hmm. rigorously I mean yeah. surely there are financial implications for that mm. how did you you know manage to do it and, and, and was it a frightening step to take yeah I mean I one of the reasons I could do that was because I had saved up in Japan I while I was posted so I could I was earning less than I was spending for 
a couple of years, but I could rely on the savings that I'd accrued. So yeah, absolutely, finances are come into it. Yeah. Um, because you know, part time on a civil servant salary in London is yeah, <laughs> it doesn't course, stretch that far. Um, so yeah, there are a number of factors, and this is what's called the development pathway from beginner to elite. And you know you're you're constantly trying to move forward, trying to move to a higher level, sorting out the rest of your life as you go along, uh, you know finances and family and all the rest of it. So it's it's quite tough, and to stay on it all the way up to the top is is really tough, and it takes a long time. And how long did it take you to reach mm. elite level? So from age eleven to when I stood on the start line at the Beijing Olympics, it was twenty-four years. Mm. I've written about this in my book. Yes, you know, nearly quarter of a century. <laughs> yeah. So it was a very, very <laughs> long time, and I mean, for a lot of that time, I was concentrating on work and earning a living. Yeah. It wasn't all training.、Um, well, that's why I come back to the idea of the, it, whether certain people are just psychologically not capable of this, because that、mm. takes a degree of perseverance that I feel must be innate. Because most people,、yeah. if they can't have something in a few years, they won't want it at all. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. And this this desire I had was was long lasting.、Mm. So yeah, I mean, a lot of people quit. You know, I was at university with very talented runners, and pretty much all of them. Quit and、yes. went off into sort of normal jobs. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's、yeah. why they call it elite, yeah, know, elite sports. Yeah, because it's, yeah. it's the, the people who are willing to strive for the very top. Yeah, you, you know? know, you have to have a combination of the the drive, the mental toughness, the physical ability to do it, and then everything else in your life has to be organised to support that. Yes. So, can you talk me through what what a typical sort of training regimen would be would would look like? You know, how、yeah. how much are we talking here? How many <laughs> hours a day? What sort of、yeah. thing do you have to so, do? So, so when I was training full time, I would get up at about seven on an easy day.、Mm. I would have a coffee, go running for about seventy five minutes, and then you know do stretching and all the rest of it as well. I would come back, have breakfast, go back to bed for about up to an hour. Then I would get up, do stretching. Uh, maybe go to the physio,、uh, have lunch. Then I would do work related to my sport. So, for example, updating anti-doping whereabouts information. So, for athletes, have to state for an hour a day, three sixty-five a year, where they will be for an hour a day. Oh,、okay. yeah. So you have to keep that information up to date. And if you don't, that's a that's one strike. Yes. And three strikes can lead to a ban.、Oh, I didn't know about that. Yeah,、okay. and then sort of contracts with sponsors, travel, you know, doing that sort of sport-related work. Then I would train again in the afternoon, run up to an hour, maybe do a, a weight training session, have dinner, shower, bit of rest, go to bed, <laughs> and、yes. then on a tough day, I would get up, have breakfast, have about an hour of of work. Then I would go and do a, a hard session, and that would take two to two and a half hours altogether. Come back, have lunch, go to bed. Oh, sorry, have an ice bath, have lunch, go to bed. <laughs>、um, sleep for an hour, an hour and a half. Get up, do more work. Then again, some strength training. Go to the physio. Then do an easy run in the evening, early evening. Have dinner, a bit of relaxing, go to bed. So it's quite relentless. Well, it feels like、mm. everything you do in your waking moments then. Is related to the pursuit. Yeah, yeah, it can become like that, and it's quite monodimensional,、mm. and it's it's not that healthy, if I'm honest, because <laughs> your your life becomes quite one track. Well, can you have time for a social life at all within that? Yeah, a little bit.、Um, I mean, especially after I had done a big marathon, I would take a period of rest where I could travel, see friends more easily. Yes,、um, you know, take it a bit easy. But when I was training in, the, let's say, the three months before a mar- big marathon, I, I didn't do very much of that. So it's quite a monastic life、yeah. in some ways. And if you、yeah. take a few days off or a week off, does that just completely reset you? You know, is it important that you have to do something, at least something, every day towards your? So I had a、health? rest day about once every eight to nine days, completely off everything. Okay. So. That that was I found that really important. Some athletes never have rest days, and if they don't need them, that's fine. Yes.、Um, and then, yeah, I would have periods of sort of less training when I could be a bit more relaxed. And、yeah. were were you working with this coach from the start 
always, always that something that so um, I had later. a number of coaches through my career yes um, d depending on you know my age and the event I was doing and then at the end I was basically self coached oh, okay. because I, I came to the point where I, I kind of knew what I had to do yeah. you know, training for the marathon is is not rocket science it's but do you think for younger athletes who who are new to to this regime, mm. having a coach is an important figure. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think self coaching is is a good option, perhaps for older athletes mm -hmm. who've who've kind of matured into the event. They they've learned the event, they know what they're doing. But for younger athletes, definitely, I think a coach is is really valuable. So, can you talk to me a bit about the process of getting to the Olympics? How does yeah. that work? <laughs> so, it seems so unfathomable, doesn't it? it yeah, seems like such a, yeah, an impossible goal. Yeah. Well, I mean. Th the bare bones of it is you have to qualify and be selected by your country. Mm. So qualification, um, for example, the women's marathon at Tokyo, the Tokyo Olympics, the time was 2.29.30. Um, so you have to run that. Right. Um, there's now also a ranking system. So you, a few athletes could get in without the time, but with a good ranking. But yes. for the sake of argument, let's say the time. And then you also have to be selected by your country. So in an event where, let's say, uh, there are only three slots per event per country in athletics. Yes. So let's say there are 10 people qualified. Then you have the trials and you have to be in the top three. Or to, The selection process varies, mm. but you have to be within the top three to be, you know, to be selected. So that's the bare, bare bones of it. Yes. But you know, to run 2.29.30 for the marathon... You can't do it just like that. You have to be training for some years. Yes. The marathon, you can basically do two to three times a year. So, you know, you get relatively few goes at it. So if you mess up or you get a cold or the weather's bad. Yeah. You know, you, you sometimes need more than one attempt to really crack it. And did you have more than one attempt? Mm, well, my first marathon was in 2004, April. Mm. I was aiming for the Athens Olympics and I failed to qualify and I was seventh of the Brits, so I didn't get on the team. But at the end of that race, I felt I could do much better. So I, I persevered. And then the following year, I qualified for the World Championships by eight seconds. And then the following year, no, sorry, that autumn, so autumn of 2005, I ran the qualifying standard for Beijing 2008. So yeah. three years in advance, uh. I'd done the qualifying standard. But the qualifying period is usually... Well, for the marathon, it's usually 18 months before the actual event. So that was outside the qualifying period. So I had to do it again within the qualifying right. period. And I managed to do that. And yeah. how do you know that, you know that you can improve from the time you've got? I mean, there must be some athletes <laughs> who think, that's probably as, as good as I'm going to get. So maybe I should stop yeah. now. You know, how do you know yeah. that, there's more, that you have more potential than that? Well, it can be, let's say you've had a build-up which has been plagued by injuries or illness, you've missed training, you've yes. been to a race and you felt out of sorts. That would indicate to you that there's more in the tank and you can improve. Whereas if you've had a sort of flawless build-up, you've been at it for a few years, you have an absolute cracker of a race and you still miss the qualifying time. I see, yeah. Probably you're, you're not going to make it. And isn't that fear of injury and mm. ill health just, it must always be there because it can just, yeah. it could take you out of the Olympics. Yeah. I mean, you know. 10 days before the Olympics, I had this pain in my foot, the Beijing Olympics. Yes. And I thought I had a stress fracture and that would have been it for me. Yeah. You know, that would have been, it would have been over. Uh, but fortunately it settled down and I was able to race and I became the, the best ever British woman in the Olympic marathon, joint best. So, you know, just like that, your plans can be out the window. Yeah. So it's it's quite an insecure existence. Yeah, I mean, it feels like there has to be a lot. Right, there's a lot riding on it, for one thing, but mm. there has to be a lot of things that sort of fall into place yeah, for exactly. it to work. I mean, not necessarily yeah. all the hard work, but on top of that, elements yeah. of luck. Yeah, you know? there's, there's real elements of luck and the weather. And in a long event like the marathon, you know, in the, for the women, they're out for nearly two and a half hours. Yes. A lot can go wrong in that time. Or well, same in the men's marathon, something like the 100 metres. Of course, things can go wrong, but it's over in 9, 10 seconds, 11 seconds. Yes. Um, and you can do it much more frequently. So how did you feel when you qualified? Absolutely over the moon, yeah. I mean, 
going to the Olympics was my dream and I'd worked so hard since I failed to qualify on my debut. Mm. So yeah, it was, it was fantastic. And uh, at that time, I was pretty much sure of a spot on the team based on who else, the other British women performances. Yes. So yeah, it was it was really fantastic, and yeah. And can you tell us a bit about the Olympic experience and, and going out there and you know yeah. the, the whole thing? Because it just it's something that very few people get to experience. Yeah. So Beijing was my first in two thousand and eight. Um, I was living in Tokyo at the time, so I did a recce to Beijing in April two thousand and eight, and mm. I, I ran the test event, so I was able to run on the course, um, which which was also great see what the pollution was like <laughs> okay. and then it came <laughs> came around to august and i traveled to beijing only three days before the event and again you have to be so careful with you know catching colds on flights wearing compression socks all that sort of thing because yeah. if you get if you catch a cold three days before the olympics that's it yeah of course um, yeah and then being and then, accustomed to the climate and that sort of thing mm, i mean is, is yeah. it a different oh yeah it was very hot very humid so I spent two weeks doing heat acclimatization at home in Tokyo, uh, which involved getting up really early, like three, four o'clock, running in the cool of the day for initially yes. until I was gradually acclimatized to it. And then I would go out at 7, 8 a.m. The start in Beijing, I think, was at 7 a.m. Um, so I, I got used to training in that period of that time of the day. Mm. Tokyo and Beijing have quite similar climates, so I was... I was in a good place to do the acclimatization. Does it change your mental attitude when you get to the Olympics and you know that everyone's watching? Suddenly there are all <laughs> these eyes on you across the globe. Yeah. I mean, surely that makes it a completely different experience. It does. It adds to the pressure, but you you can't you have to not think about that. You know, you really have to focus on your your performance because if you think, you know, there are millions of people watching me, that's not going to help you run fast. Well, because I wonder about that sometimes. Because you know, you yeah. see, even in something like Wimbledon, and, and you see someone get get almost they've almost won, and then they fall apart. And you think, is that because they're suddenly conscious of where they yeah. are and people looking on and that kind of thing? It, yeah, it, performance anxiety, I suppose. Yeah, I think people have different ways of dealing with this. So, for some people, some athletes, they might think of the millions watching, and it really doesn't bother them. Mm. Or you know, the, the athletes who who crowd please you know they they thrive on it uh but i'm i'm quite a sort of shy introverted type of character so if i thought about lots of people watching me yes it would just be distracting but then once but, you're at that level surely i mean you're in the public eye yeah yeah know. i mean i was always just so focused on my performance i to be honest i didn't really think about that sort of thing i mean quite often at the london marathon people would my friends would say to me oh i was at mile 18 i shouted for you and I haven't heard any of it oh, really? because I'm just completely focused uh, on, on the task in hand. Um, but the, the atmosphere of the event does, that weighs on you. Yeah. I mean, in the, in the actual race, uh, the woman who eventually won it, Constantina Tomescu Dita, she went ahead. We started off quite slowly and then she went off on her own after about 15 miles, I think. No, it's earlier than that. And we all just let her go. Um, and I think that was because, you know, I was thinking, it's the Olympics, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I didn't have the confidence to go with her. And that's one regret I have about that race that because I was in the shape of my life and I wish I'd gone with her. Yeah. But you, you can't, there are no ifs in sport. You either do it or you don't. And I didn't do it. And, you know, good for her that she won it and took that gamble. What was uh, the highlight, do you think, of your career? What was the moment that you most enjoyed? Well, but Beijing was one, but also I won only one marathon in my whole career, which was the Osaka Ladies Marathon in Japan. Yes. And that was so special because the previous summer, well, that, that was 2007, the World Championships were in Osaka. And again, I was in the form of my life, but I messed up my tactics and finished ninth. Mm -hmm. But then I returned to the same city, same course, five months later in January 2008. And I ran a much better race. I held back and, and won it and defeated a good field, including Constantina, who went on to win the Olympics. Right. So that was, that was a, a process of learning from mistakes and doing better. And I've written about this in my book. Well, so. so that, I mean, you say... It was about tactics. Mm. So what, what sort of tactics in a, a, a long-form race yeah. help, help, help a, an athlete? So, well, in, in, in the Osaka that I won, 
I held back until about 20 miles. And by that you mean you're not putting everything into no. it? No. So at okay. halfway, we went through halfway in a good time, but I didn't feel like I was running at 100%, far from it. Right. And I wanted to push on, but I knew that, you know, you're far from the end because the second half is much harder than the first half in a marathon. So I forced myself to just hold back and stay with the group. And then when we reached about 20 miles, then I pushed on. And initially, the race before, you had been pushing from very early, had you? Well, no, in the World Championships, I pushed on from about 29k. So that, that would have been about uh, sort of 18, 19 miles. And I, I surged too quickly and suffered. And then the rest of the group passed me. Well, yes. I dropped them and then they passed me. And I, I just drifted in the last few miles. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I suppose a lot of us who aren't familiar with this wouldn't even think about this. Yeah, These so sort of ideas. We just think, yeah. get out there and run as fast as you can. But it's, yeah, it's well, not that, is it? <laughs> well, so, I mean, in theory, that's what you should do. You should just run from start to finish as fast as you can because yeah. otherwise you can't go any faster. But the championship races are very tactical. Right. And it often comes down to, you know, people who are gutsy enough to strike out on their own and hope nobody goes with them or yeah. or just go and, and try and drop the others. Um, I mean, in the London Marathon 2009, where I finished second, I was much more gutsy and I went with the leaders. Yes. And the eventual winner and I were sort of doing a duel in the final stages. Right. So I, that was much more gutsy. And in on the day, she just was in better shape than me and, and she won. What's the relationship like with competitors when it gets to those sort of situations? <laughs> is there any sort of animosity there? Or oh, like well, it, when you're in a race, I mean, <laughs> well, obviously you don't want to do anything that's going to get you disqualified. Yes. Um, but, you know, it, it, you're out there to win. You're not going to be nice to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. What do you what do you feel the role of athletes are in society? Are that you know a, a lot of people look up to sports people as role models, mm. and you've written a book and and, mm. and as you say, you're one of one of the target readers is a younger athlete, mm. someone coming up. So mm. how conscious of you mm. are you of your position in in, uh, in society? Yeah, I think athletes can be role models f for everybody on a number of different issues, and. I mean, one athlete who's, who was incredibly helpful to me was Dame Kelly Holmes. So she she established the Dame Kelly Holmes Trust, mm. which helps young adults in, in difficulties to sort of get their lives back on track, but also helps retired elite athletes to learn new skills, forge second careers. Yes. And after I retired and I was in a bad place, they were very helpful. And I think Kelly, I think it's just a fabulous thing that she's done by setting up this charity. Yes. And of course, she's a brilliant role model herself, an amazing athlete. She's she's struggled with mental ill health herself, but, you know, comes out fighting yeah. <laughs> always. Um, so, yeah, I think I think athletes, they can really be role models, but you're, you're kind of thrust into the role of role model. And some athletes may not want that. They might not have the, the background and expertise on issues that they're asked to speak about. Yeah. Um, yeah, because, I mean, a lot of the media uh, do elevate sports stars as role models and also mm. criticise them if they don't yeah. have the right moral behaviour. I mean, yeah. I think that particularly <laughs> happens with footballers. And, of course, yeah. you know, footballers can be some of the most badly behaved. <laughs> yeah. You know, so is that is that fair, really, to hold these people to the, these standards simply yeah. because they're good at a particular sport? Yeah, I think in a way it's not fair, to be honest. I mean, that like I say, they're thrust into the into the role model kind of arena, mm. but they they may not want that. And yeah. you know, if you're an athlete, your job is to train and compete. It's not to be a commentator on the the issues of the day necessarily. I think for retired older athletes, it's much easier because. You have more time. You can yeah. think about these things. You're not under the pressure of performing every day. Um, but I think athletes can can and are powerful if they, you know, think carefully about important issues and focus their efforts where they can make a difference. Because, of course, recently a lot of athletes have felt compelled to be spokespeople uh, about various social mm. issues, mm. you know. And I know yourself, you, you've been speaking out about women's sports and the importance of preserving sex-based categories. Yes. Martina Navratilova, Sharon Davis, you know, yeah. the, 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 so many people who, who who obviously are so passionate because they've been through yeah. this process and they, they see the trouble. Mm. But it does come with um, downsides, doesn't it? Yeah, and I, I mean, I've been speaking out about 
uh, the female category being for, should be for women only, only for about a year. Right. Because before that, I saw athletes like Paula Radcliffe, Kelly Holmes, Sharon Davis, getting a load of abuse speaking out on this subject. And I, I thought, I, I just don't want that. And my father was really ill as well, so I was sort of occupied with that. Mm. Um, but I saw a tweet from Sharon Davis a year ago in which she said, if you are silent in this, you are complicit. And that was a wake-up call for me. And at the same time, Maya Forstatter's employment tribunal ruling came out. And that gave me the confidence to, to speak. I think one of the earliest uh, sort of canaries in the coal mine with this was Martina Navratilova, because I remember an early tweet she did, or an early comment. Mm. That, and I suddenly started seeing these LGBT activists saying, Martina Navratilova is no longer part of the LGBT community. And I yeah. thought, well, hang on a minute. Yeah. She's a lesbian athlete who's been yeah. open about her sexuality much yeah. earlier than it was, at a time when it was mm. risky mm. To, to do yeah. so. She's been a, actually a trailblazer for gay yeah. rights. Yeah. So for them to say that to her, yeah. I just it's, it's smacked of just uh, yeah. ingratitude and, and all sorts of things, mm. you know? She made that point in her interview with Julie Bindle, which I thought was great. You know, for her to be out as a lesbian back in the 80s yeah. was difficult and sometimes dangerous but now uh, certainly in the UK you know gay rights are equal to everybody's rights you know we've got same-sex marriage you know it's much easier to be out so I think it's I mean I'm not gay so I I maybe shouldn't speak for, for gay and lesbian people but my impression is it is much easier to be out it now is, than it yeah. was in her when she was a young player yes yeah but, but of course you know in a sense that's a good example, isn't it, of how her being a, a an elite athlete, a uh, world champion, and suddenly there comes an expectation that she's also a, a social commentator, mm. which she didn't have mm. to do. She didn't have to be yeah. out and she didn't have mm. to talk about it. Um, yeah. And yeah. And great. Good for her. You know, she she's vocal on a number of issues, you know, abortion, gun rights in the US, all sorts of things. And I, I think that's fantastic because she's she's a a leader and an icon and a you know just a, an amazing role model i mean there are very prominent retired athletes like her who are silent on things like women's sport mm. so yeah i mean i suppose you must must understand why i mean you said yourself mm. seeing the levels of abuse that various athletes were getting or people just generally mm. uh, for, for for expressing a view on this and then you talk about how Sharon Davis says, you know, but your com silence is com complicit. But mm. she also made the point, I think, that a lot of the people who contact her privately from the athletic community yeah. share the view yes. uh, that, that they must retain women's yeah. sports yeah. for biological women. Because if they don't, I mean, my understanding is that the reason why there were sex categories introduced in the first place was so that you could have female athletes, so that they, yeah. they could be elite athletes. Yeah, I mean, the difference, the gap between male and female average performance is so massive that if the female category did not exist, women would not be in sport at all. So, for example, like in 2022, in the gap between the top male in, the, let's say, the 100 metres and the top female in the 100 metres will be thousands of men and boys, thousands. Yes. So no woman would ever qualify for anything, not just at the Olympics, but lower down, you know, from the age of about 12 performance diverges. So then why is it that, that people make the counterpoint all the time? They say things like, well, look at Laurel Hubbard in the weightlifting category. She didn't win. And therefore, yeah. this disproves this idea that trans athletes will dominate women's sports. Yeah, you can't judge fairness by the outcome. So if I entered the Tour de France with a motor, I wouldn't win because I'm not a very good cyclist. Right. It doesn't make it OK. Yes. <laughs> so, so, you know... Dr. Emma Hilton did some great analysis on uh, Laurel Hubbard's lifts compared to her weight, because weightlifting is a weight, to, you know, weight is relevant. Yes. And, you know, she, she just wasn't very good by elite female standards. Right. Be because the gap is just so massive. Yes. So, so elite females will be equivalent to just not very good males. Yes. In a lot of sports, because the gap is so massive. But I think the instance of Leah Thomas changed a lot of people's minds on this. I think a lot yeah. of people didn't really understand yeah. what this was about. And there was something quite striking about the visual image of Leah Thomas on the podium yeah. with the competitors and towering over these competitors. And I think yeah. I'm, I'm sensing a shift in public attitude yeah. off the bait. And sometimes it can be one thing. 
that changes yeah. people's minds. Yeah, I completely agree. I think there's a lot of lack of understanding about sport out there. Mm. And that's not a criticism. You know, plenty of people, sport's not their thing. And I'm not, I'm not criticising them for that. But that leads to a real lack of understanding. But mm. when somebody like Leah Thomas comes along and it's really, like, yes. obvious to them, yes. then I think they, they start to understand better. I mean, to give you an example, the qualifying standard in the men's marathon in Tokyo was 2.11.30. The women's world record is 2.14.04. Oh, right. So no yeah. woman is going to come within a million miles of qualifying for the men's. That's how big the difference is. So, you know, this is... The only people who benefit from this are males competing in the female category. It doesn't work the other way. So then so, what about an, a, a system where you, it would be a case-by-case -case basis and you would yeah. assess each individual as to whether they could compete in the, yeah. in the women's category? Yeah. So to me, this is completely unworkable because, well, how do you, how do you draw up criteria to decide who, which trans woman can be, can be allowed to compete and which not? You know, who decides? Who, what qualifications do those people need? Yeah. <laughs> who appoints them? Um, you know, and it's discriminatory against trans women. So, you know, let's say in the women's marathon, let's say, supposing a trans woman comes along with 218 PB and another one with 219 PB, you could say, well, 218 is a bit close to the women's world record. They're, they're too fast. We won't allow them. Yes. But 219, OK, we'll allow you. It, it's kind of arbitrary where you draw the line. Yes, and it, it would be difficult to avoid any kind of accusation of discrimination in that situation. Yeah, I think it's discriminatory against individual trans women Yes. Uh, doing case by case. But then what and is the solution? Is it this idea of an open category? Is that possibly one way around this? Yeah, I mean, you can... Well, one solution being debated is to have a protected female category, which is for biologically female people only, yes. and then an open category in which basically everybody else can compete. Yes. Um, another option is what FINA have gone for, so male and female plus a third open category. Yes. I mean, the details of that are to be determined. So I guess it's possible that they might say open will be in with the male category, not as a third option. Right. But as I understood it, they're looking at male, female or open. Because, I mean, can you understand the idea that, you know, if you are someone who is, your vocation is sport and, uh, you know, you have that passion that mm. you shared of becoming an elite athlete, but you also have this gender dysphoria. Yeah. You need to transition in order to be happy. Yeah. It would be horrible, wouldn't it, to have to give up your the other passion in your life. Yeah, but they don't need to give it up. They can still compete, you know, in, in the category of their sex at birth or in an open category. Yes. You know, categories by sex exist for a reason, which we just discussed, which is that women would be nowhere in sport if, if the female category didn't exist. Yes. So it has a good reason to exist, and then we have to enforce it. There's no point having a female category if you allow males into it. That is totally self-defeating. Does yeah. this, have you spoken to many younger athletes, up and coming people, and how they feel about, about these developments? Yeah, I've spoken to a few in athletics and they all agree with me. They, they, they understand totally the difference between males and females in performance. And they, they think sex categories is, is what we need and they just think it's unfair if male born people compete in the female category. I think if you do sport day to day, you're at the coal face, as it were, and yes. you can see with your own eyes every single day what male advantage is in terms of speed, power, strength. So you kind of intuitively accept that sport must be separated into male and female categories. Because it's not just about changing your hormonal balance, is it? It's, it's, it's not just about taking hormones for a certain number of years. No. No. There is the element mm. of going through puberty. Yeah, it's essentially male puberty, which gives males the, the advantages that they have compared to females. Yes. You know, and puberty is a, a process which takes several years, driven by testosterone, and the result of uh, in an adult male is much greater physical abilities. Yes. And tinkering with testosterone levels in an adult male does not remove what puberty has done. It removes a little bit, so things like haemoglobin 
reduce quite quickly. Yes. But bone density, muscle mass, skeleton shape, skeleton size, longer limbs, bigger heart, bigger lungs, all these things don't change at all. Yes. So I mean, it's yeah, we hear this analogy, once you've boiled an egg, you know, you can't unboil it, yes. even if you put it in cold water. It's it's really the same. You well, because people have made the comparison with uh, though with doping with people who cheat. Yeah. You know, and do you think that's a fair comparison to make? It is in a way because doping gives you an unfair advantage, and of course, testosterone is one of the substances which is used in doping. Yes. And is on the banned list. Uh, so there are similarities, but the difference is is that doping generally gives you a relatively tiny advantage. Yeah. Male puberty gives you a massive advantage compared to females. So then why are there so many people just outright denying this? I mean, <laughs> there seem to be a lot of people now. I mean, it used to be, you know, gender is a social construct was the, the line. There are now activists claiming that biological sex is a social yeah. construct. Yeah. Which is something that I read back at university and thought it was hilarious. Yeah. Because it was so obviously wrong. Yeah. Um, but now that seems to be quite a mainstream view, which I never saw that coming. Yeah, I mean, it's gender identity ideology, to me, seeks to deny the existence of biological sex and replace it. Yes. Um, and we know that this has very serious consequences for women and girls, serious consequences for female-only spaces like sports, prisons, rape crisis shelters, domestic refuges, all these toilets, changing rooms, all these, all these previously female-only single-sex spaces. Um, I mean, there seems to be a misinterpretation, doesn't there? When, when, when people make that argument that you're making, uh, they're often accused of trying to paint trans people as predatory or dangerous or anything like that. Yeah, How would you respond no, to that? I would say males are a danger to females. I, I can't make it more stark than that. You know, the vast, I think it's over 90% of violent and sexual crimes are committed by males. And females just don't know which males are dangerous and yes, which are harmless it's you the don't it's you don't a minority of males yeah, that are the dangerous yeah. ones but so, you don't know who they are yeah we don't know who they are they don't have written on their forehead dangerous or harmless yes so safeguarding kind of protocols work to exclude all males from places where females are vulnerable so yes. you know toilets change rooms where they're asleep uh, but but also in things like sports where they're well they're vulnerable in a safety related sport yes um so these these practices exist for good reason and these are all very rational arguments and yet i've been shocked over the past couple of years uh, how these sorts of arguments are interpreted as mm. being grounded in hate yeah and transphobia and and um right far right bigotry <laughs> and i've even heard the word fascist yeah. used about these i mean and you must have received some of these this kind of flack. So yeah. how do you how do you feel when people are saying these things about you? Well, to me, the arguments are very clear cut. You know, biological sex exists. Differences between males and females exist. Sex is immutable. There are only two sexes. These are facts to me. So I'm I'm clear in where I'm coming from. But, but what also concerns me is just denial of reality, people speaking outright lies and presenting them as the truth, you know, alternative facts, this is the, this yes. is the phrase for the, <laughs> for the moment. Um, but also just the inability to put together a coherent argument, to disagree with people, yes. debate, we seem to have lost that somehow, which I think is a real shame. And this is one thing I write about in my book is the value of critical thinking, mm. which I, I learned from my parents and from, my, uh, from university well, and school. You know, the ability to defend a position, argue why you believe in it, present evidence and facts, um, counter people who disagree with you. Yes. These are all such important life skills. And they seem to be completely absent from the gender debate. You know, if you, if I say something which somebody else disagrees with, they'll just block me or... <laughs> well, I mean, but, but it's not just activists we're talking about here. These kind of, this inability to think critically, to apply logic and reason and mm. to seek evidence for one's claims, is not just coming from activists, it's also in the mainstream commentariat. Yeah. Uh, that, that's what troubles me about it. It's also yeah. in figures of authority. Yes. Who are, who are meant teachers, academics. Yeah. So, so how do we... 
how do we restore the primacy of critical thinking when yeah. the, the very people who are meant to be beacons of critical yeah. thought are incapable of it? Yeah, well, I think challenge is a good good way to do it. Um, you know, if, if somebody says something which you feel is just untrue or incoherent, then challenge them. Yes. Um, and... I guess we can all make an effort to have conversations in person. So make the time and arrangements to, to meet people, to talk face to face, to go through the arguments with the reassurance that if you disagree, you know, the world won't end. <laughs> I think, well, that's not the way people behave, though. They, yeah. they, they, they say that if we disagree, you are erasing my existence. Yeah, that's the I mean, phrase this is just used. this is complete nonsense. You know, if I disagree with a trans rights activist, I'm not calling for them to disappear or die. I'm just I have a different view. Yes. And, you know, I, I can say males should not compete in women's sport. That doesn't mean I'm trying to erase the existence of a, a trans-identifying male. All I'm saying is, you are born male, therefore you have big physical advantages, therefore, sorry, but you can't compete in the women's category. I'm not, I'm not denying their right to exist or anything like that. It's just, you know, it's, this is all hyperbole. Have you had any success in speaking to activists about this? Because <laughs> well, I invite them on my show all the time and yeah. I've never... Oh, yeah. That's not true. There's been one or two who have agreed to come on and we've had really interesting, stimulating conversations, but okay. on the whole... Yeah. No. Not not face to face. I mean, on Twitter, I, a, a British athlete... Uh, took issue with what I was saying about Laurel Hubbard and Leah Thomas. And I tried to have a, an engagement with him on the substance. Yes. I said to him, you know, if you, if you support males in female sport, please tell us your arguments. I said, um, if you know books about trans people's lives, please send me the titles because yes. I want to educate myself. Uh, I said, do you believe that Leah Thomas is not male? Because this was one of the things that he was, he was having a go at me about didn't get a single answer so uh, I just didn't know what to do then I was trying to engage on the substance and just got nowhere yeah it seems so emotive I mean at the moment I saw an article today about Tom Daly saying that he is furious uh, yeah. he's absolutely yeah. furious uh, that trans women can't complete compete yeah. against biological women yeah has he thought that through do you think does it does it matter less to him because he's a man we, uh, who knows I mean What's really interesting about that is he and his husband have used a surrogate mother. They have a child. Yes. So he knows what a woman is when he wants a pregnancy <laughs> gestated. And yet when it comes to female athletes, he doesn't seem bothered about fairness for them. And so, does, but how does it feel when prominent role models, again, when we talk about people like Tom Daly, people who are famous uh, elite athletes, mm. are making the case that we don't need sex categories in sport let's just do away with them yeah um, how does that I, feel it's very disappointing to me I, I think they haven't thought it through right uh, I mean in Tom's case I, I don't know I can't speak for Tom I mean have him on your show um, uh, I'd love to <laughs> yeah I would, I would absolutely love to I, but I doubt he'd come on but. yeah I suspect <laughs> because he's gay he feels solidarity with the LGBT movement in its entirety and yes. that's completely understandable you know people who you consider to be part of your group you instinctively feel solidarity for but being gay straight bisexual makes no difference to your sports performance you know anybody can be whatever they want and just sport it's nothing to do with sport but being male or female has a lot to do with your sporting performance so being trans and being gay straight bisexual actually in terms of sporting performance are completely different they're kind of lumped together yeah. in the same group that's confused me about the way in which why w would we arrange sport which is something which is all about physicality yeah. around identity you know because yeah. you may as well say we'll have a marxist category <laughs> yeah or you know? religion or voting pref yeah it's it's introduced something into how we create categories in sport which is totally irrelevant yes you know it's like saying right people with long hair in that race people with short hair in that yeah. race yeah or yeah christians hindus it's it's completely meaningless and because of the asymmetry in the effect so it's very beneficial to males disbeneficial to females mm. i feel it's it's really about the rights and careers and bank balances of, of males. Well, a lot of feminists have said that there's a lot of misogyny within this mm. conversation, within this discourse. Do you think that's right? Yes, I do, actually. Yeah. 
because, I mean, for example, on, lang on language, we've seen the word woman and everything related to the word woman, even female now, being erased mm. and being, being redefined as body parts. You know, Such as in NHS literature, so yeah. saying birthing parents, yeah, problems, yeah, women, that kind of thing. But we don't see the same nearly as much about men. No, men, men are just called men often. You know, in the NHS guidance recently, the women were erased, but the men were still just men. I think. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so I think, and certainly in sport, it's it's basically something which benefits males only. And how would and, you have felt as a young? I mean, you say that this was an aspiration that you had from a very young age. Yeah. If you had seen this happening when you were young, would this have put you off attempting it? Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, I think I would have certainly felt it was unfair. And as a, as a, as a girl, if I saw officials and people in charge saying, no, no, this is all right, you have to just run with the boys, I, you know, I probably would have accepted it because that's what, that's what you do as a young person. But... I would have thought it was really unfair, and I think I would have quit, to be honest. Well, I've seen a lot of uh, people, young people who had to swim against Leah Thomas and people like yeah. that, making the point that, you know, it's just, they felt they couldn't say anything yeah. because they'd be branded a bigot or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And the idea that, you know, if you're aiming for the top, as you were, yeah. you know, the idea that, that that becomes an impossibility, Yeah. I can't see how that's anything other than demoralising. It's totally demoralising. I mean, I, I know of women in sport now who are who are quitting because they really? they have to compete against males yeah and i think girls and young women right now will be self excluding because it's 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 you look at something and it's unfair you just think what's the point why would i put myself through hours or even years of hard training you know to, to never be able to win it's pointless and how big is the problem of intimidation here because you know when i mentioned the the athletes who were speaking out about it I, I can't name that many. There's a, there's, yeah. the, there's, a, there's a handful, and yeah. they're very prominent, yeah. but because they get so much hate. you know, do, do you think, Where do you think the consensus lies on this? Well, I mean, I've seen three polls recently. They were, they were Twitter polls, so it's not peer-reviewed science. Yeah. But, but still, I mean, one of them had over 60,000 votes. That was won by Sharon Davis. Every single one of them, they basically asked the same question, you know, should males compete in female sport? Yes. All of them said 97% no. The question was slightly different, but basically it was 97% against it. So I think the general population's, the general public's view is males should not compete in women's But sports. that's what's so interesting because this is clearly, I mean, I agree with you and I think it's absolutely clear that the vast majority, virtually everyone knows that it's unfair yeah. uh, not to have sex categories in sport. Yeah. And yet that is seen as the marginal view in the media discourse. <laughs> you know, we're the yeah. only channel that talks about it. You know, but, yeah. you know it, it's, it's, it's seen as this fringe yeah. uh, thing but that, that is pe uh, peddled by bigots and things. Yeah. And of course... I, the, you know. This is one of the most extraordinary things about this debate is I've been a sort of centre lefty all my life. And on this issue, I find myself agreeing with GB News, Donald Trump Jr., <laughs> Fox <laughs> News, The Mail. You know, it's, it's only the right wing press who will speak the truth on it, really. Um, but that obviously leaves left wing. I mean, all of the, the feminists I've had on my show are left wing. All of them. I don't think, there was, yeah. I think there's one who was yeah. uh, who was a conservative. Yeah. Um, so it's just it, this is extraordinary to me, and it's because the left just aren't willing to defend women's rights. So why is that? Because traditionally you would have thought that the left is all about equality and, yeah. and you know. Well, when I first came into this debate, I I whenever a prominent person on the left spoke my expectation was that they would defend women's rights i thought mm. of course they will they're yeah. lefties and then they say oh no no you know trans identifying males have priority in sports or whatever and i was just aghast yes i you know i've seen people say that this debate reveals the misogyny among people on the left and I think I think that's true. And I've been I've been quite shocked by it. Cheer, you know, I was cheerfully going along thinking all these people care about women's rights. Yes. <laughs> and now I've seen that they just don't. And that's that's been quite a wake up call. And when you started talking about this, I mean, you said that you were nervous to do so. But mm. were you surprised at the reaction you got? 
actually the amount of support I had was overwhelming. Mm. I've had a few incidents of abuse, but the support I've had has been absolutely overwhelming. And I have complete strangers contacting me quite regularly saying, yes. thank you for speaking up. I agree with you completely. But for one reason or other, I can't say a word like my employer will sack me if I do or, you know, they, they can't. They, they don't feel they can say anything. So I think they're just relieved to see people in the public eye mm. taking a stand on it. And, and, and yeah. that is the point, isn't it? That people are scared for their, for their jobs. And not yeah, everyone can afford exactly. to take the risk. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So people... I, I totally understand how people are, are scared for their jobs. And, I mean, I'm lucky that I'm self-employed, but there have been a few incidents where I've... I think I've lost work opportunities. Really? Um, yeah, or people have tried to get me sacked from them. And what about friends and associates? Has everyone been supportive of your views um, there? It's been mixed, so some very much so. Um, one or two others, they're a bit more equivocal or they're kind of on the other side, but I, I don't think they've really thought it through. Yeah, that I mean, seems to be... Mm. A, we keep coming back to that, that, mm. that this point, that mm. so many of the people who are, who are very vociferous in this debate haven't really thought about it or, dis or been willing to discuss. Yeah. So until yeah. we can get... Mm. What, exactly what you say in the book about critical thinking, until we can get people together again, yeah. talking about things, mm. yeah. without throwing insults, assuming everyone's evil, Yeah, yeah. we're not going to get anywhere, are we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think most people come at this with tolerance. You know, yeah. most of us want live and let live. And we've seen the struggles that, you know, ethnic minorities have had, gay people have had. And we want sort of persecuted minorities to, to live peaceful and productive lives. I don't I think there are actually very few people who, you know, want to keep minorities down. Yeah. So we come at this with, yeah, why not? Everybody's welcome. But then if you just drill down into the detail on sport, for example, and you see that it means males competing in the female category, then you think, mm, actually, that's not fair. Well, I think that's and that's the point. Perhaps our key assumption should be that most people are just decent people, and pe yeah. people on the right and the left, they all just want everyone to get on with yeah. life. And you know, yeah. the, this caricature I think of politics has made it hard now because we do see it as good versus evil. It's yeah. not that. I think most people are just quite boringly decent. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, I've heard quite a few people say in about trans women in sport. It's only a few. You know, everybody's happy. Why is it a big deal? But if you sort of drill down into the detail of that, so if you say, OK, a few is OK, what about 100% of a women's sports team being biological males? Is that OK? Yes. I think everybody would say no, or most people would say no, because it's not a women's sports team, it's a men's sports team. So then you go, OK, how many males on a women's sports team OK? Is half OK? Is a third OK? Yes. Two-fifths, whatever? You know, if you when you get down into the detail, then you get to why does women's sport even exist in the first place. And it doesn't take many, does it, to have a knock-on effect? Because you, you, yeah. you know, even one uh, trans athlete in, a, in an elite competition, that not takes a place mm. that someone who's been working, could have been working for 24 years like you were. Yeah, yeah. They don't get that. Yeah, that I'm, yeah. I mean, as I said on your show in February, you know, Leah Thomas's performances at the Ivy League Championships, I calculated displaced thousands of females and then if you one of her races was viewed 5.1 million times on twitter if we say half of those were female quite a lot of them probably were swimmers yes probably quite a lot were girls and young women swimmers and they're looking at that thinking blimey is this coming to my club or school yes should i quit actually the numbers it affects are enormous yeah so, I, saw, I saw a story the other day about um a 29 year old trans skateboarder winning a competition oh, yes. and the 13 year old girl coming yeah. second and yeah. you think that's not great it's not great you no. know what's she gonna do is she gonna keep settling for second is she gonna quit is she gonna self-exclude is she gonna have to judiciously choose her competitions to avoid this person it's, yeah it's really not good people have started calling the silver medal women's gold you know and, yeah. and sort of saying that Women are just going to have to learn to settle for second best. Yeah, no, it's not fair. It's awful. You know, this is, that's the end of women's sport. Yeah, yeah. I mean, same with doping. Yeah. You know, in recent years, there have been a lot of reallocations of medals. And, I mean, my, my friend Jo Pavey, who kindly wrote the foreword for, this, for my book, she was allocated a medal from the 2007 Osaka World Championships about a couple of years ago. Mm. You know, years on... And, okay, it was in a stadium at another competition. There was a crowd who clapped. 
But, you know, if you miss that moment on the podium at the event where you've performed, that can never be no. got back again. So, you know, for this skateboarder, even if some campaign happens and she's given the gold medal, it will be after the event. Nobody will know about it. You know, it's... Do you, do you see this as being something that will be resolved relatively soon? Do you, do you see the sort of the consensus of the importance of women's sports, uh, sex-based uh, mm. categories, that that will just come back and that we will be get over this eventually? I certainly hope so. And FINA's decision, uh, followed quickly by Rugby League, gives me hope mm. that other other governing bodies will follow but institutions have been captured and especially the younger generation have all been indoctrinated well a lot of them have been indoctrinated into gender identity ideology and when those people are in decision making positions of power who knows what might happen so I'm, I'm hopeful from the FINA decision but I really don't think we're out of the woods yet <laughs> Well, Mara, thank you so much for joining me today and congratulations on the book. Thank you very much for having me. It was a real pleasure. Thanks a lot. This has been the Free Speech Nation podcast with me, Andrew Doyle, and my guest, Mara Yamauchi. If you enjoyed the show, please do like and subscribe and tell your friends. And don't forget, you can pre-order Mara's book, Marathon Wisdom. That's available to pre-order now on Amazon and Waterstones and bookshop.org. I'll see you next week.